I'm sure that when you look at me, you think, Phew, now there's an athlete. But unfortunately, you'd be wrong. Also, contrary to popular belief, I am not Scottish. Some people hate the English, I don't. They're just wankers. We, on the other hand, are colonised by wankers. Can't even find a decent culture to be colonised by. I am not tall. Okay, so now that I've cleared up all the misconceptions about me, let me get to my love of football. Footy. Soccer. Football's great, you know? There's a reason it's so popular. It's got the drama, the love, the hate, the spitting. Wow. It's got something for everyone. It's also an important outlet for men to express their emotions. If only they would outside of this context, but baby steps, eh? Not only is football beloved by many, but women's football is on the rise. You might ask, why are you distinguishing women's football from regular football? And that is because up until recently, it's been treated as a niche interest. When someone says, I'm watching the Arsenal game tonight, the assumption is the men's team. But not anymore, hopefully. A brief history of women's football in England. It was banned for 50 years. The first reported women's football team in England was founded in 1895, where the British Ladies Football Club divided into North and South teams for a game in Crouch End in March 1895. The North won by a landslide score of 7-1. to one. The captain of the team was a lady named Nettie Honeyball, which is hilarious. It's, it wasn't her real name, but it's still so funny. She also used her position to get political. There is nothing of the farcical nature about the British Ladies Football Club. I founded the association late last year with the fixed resolve of proving to the world that women are not the ornamental and useless creatures men have pictured. I must confess my convictions on all matters. Where the sexes are so widely divided are all on the side of emancipation, and I look forward to the time when ladies may sit in Parliament and have a voice in the direction of affairs, especially those which concern them most. Then the BLFC went quiet due to women being required to work in the factories during the First World War. So jump forward, it's the 1920s, and we have Dick Cares Ladies, a team in Preston, almost 10 years before the players could even vote in the UK. Their most famous fixture came on Boxing Day 1920, with an audience of 53,000 in Goodiston Park in Liverpool. <laughs> And just when you thought they'd already girl-bossed hard enough, they raised 3k for charity, which is the equivalent of 40k today. In that same year, they also beat France in the first international women's game, 2 nil for a crowd of 25,000. Um, important announcement. They kissed. Wow. They kissed. Wow. They kissed. Wow. That's, that's wow. pretty, um, wow. that's pretty, that's, wow. that's pretty gay. But then... On the 5th of December 1921, the Football Association met at its headquarters in London and announced a 50-year ban on the women's game from being played on professional grounds and pitches of clubs affiliated with the FA. The game of football is quite unsuitable for females and ought not to be encouraged. So it's not that women were forbidden from playing football outright, but because they were banned from stadiums, this led to a huge downturn in attendance, as teams had no choice but to play in parks and fields. But like a phoenix rising from the ashes, the women's FA formed again in 1969. Ayo! <laughs> In 1971, the FA had lifted its ban, with the first Women's FA Cup final in the same year. The first instance of the Women's World Cup dates back to July 1970 in Italy, but this was unofficial. During the decade, multiple countries lifted bans on women's football, hosting continental women's tournaments like in Asia in 1975. In 1984 came the first ever Women's European Championship, and England made its final to face Sweden. Sweden won 
one nail. Norwegian player Ellen Veal, Vil, Vil, Norwegian people, feel free to correct me, demanded the FIFA Congress better promote women's football, which was put to the test with the 1988 FIFA Women's Invitation Tournament in China. After the opening match of the tournament between China and Canada was attended by 45,000 people, the tournament was deemed a success, with crowds averaging 20,000. Due to its success, on the 30th of June, FIFA approved the establishment of an official World Cup for women, which was to take place in 1991 again in China. Slay. I'm sorry, but I don't know what else to say. Oh hey, that rhymed. We recently saw the conclusion of the 2023 FIFA Women's World Cup, which was hosted by Australia and New Zealand, where Spain was announced supreme. Which is fine. I would have loved to see England win, but either way, it's a win for women. History was made when England made the Women's World Cup final for the first time. Viewing records were broken with the England versus Spain game being watched by a peak BBC TV audience of 12 million. More than 1.7 million tickets were sold. This is huge and exciting. It's amazing to see women's football get the recognition it deserves. The sheer talent shown in this this year's World Cup has been magnificent. Like Chloe Kelly's penalty kick in the match against Nigeria. Kelly's shot was faster than every Premier goal in 2023. Faster than any goal recorded last season in the men's English Premier League. You know that cat meme that's like the fastest living thing on earth? They should add Chloe Kelly to that. They need to add Chloe Kelly to the Hall of Fame of Fast Cats. Charisma, uniqueness, nerve and talent. And even even if you're not someone who cares about football, consider that the rise of women's football is important on a societal level. Because representation means more young girls will participate in football and sports in general. Playing footy is fun and good for your health because it releases endorphins, which help to relieve stress. You know what also releases endorphins? Go on. Take a guess, I dare ya. That's right, I'm back today with my bestie, Lilo. Longtime funder of the cow and all her antics. Longtime facilitator of endorphins on this channel. It is the luxury pleasure brand with the mission to create satisfaction that transcends gender, orientation, race, and age without shame. You can be ashamed of being a Man United fan, but don't be ashamed of using the Lilo Enigma Wave. The Enigma Wave is a triple stimulation sonic massager, which caters to both erogenous zones. I love that word, erogenous, so fancy. And this combination leads to a powerful pleasure hybrid or pleasure smoothie, sensual smoothie, oh that's good. Because you know what they they say teamwork creates dream work. Why limit yourself to one area of satisfaction? Well, you don't have to with the Enigma Wave, as it has three motors for triple pleasure and offers eight, I can't do that with my fingers because I'm holding the mic, but eight different modes to experience, explore, and enjoy. She shoots, she scores. The Enigma Wave creates magic by using a combination of sonic waves and gentle pulses for an electric sensory experience. Oh, and the silicon is waterproof, so you can safely wash your Enigma Wave after use and or use it in the bath or shower. I'm sure you're dying to get your hands on this bad boy. So click on my link in the description to learn more about the Lilo Enigma wave and browse Lilo's vast range of products suitable for all genders and body types. Thank you Lilo for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get back to the regularly scheduled programming.
Despite the fact that women make up about 40% of athletes overall, only about 4% of sports media reporting covers women's sports. The recent recognition of women's football hits a special spot in my heart because I loved football as a kid. I was a huge Arsenal fan and I loved playing football, I played it every day. But then for secondary school that all changed. I went to a girls school and football wasn't an option there in PE or as an extracurricular and I remember requesting it and they said no. They only offered netball, which I'm not poo-pooing on netball, of course it's a real sport, but it's a majority women's sport, so I think it's kind of interesting that they opted for the most woman-y sport. So my toxic trait is that I have the most irrational response to pivoting in netball. It just gives me the ick. I, I know it's ridiculous, I know, but I just, I hate it so much. It makes me cringe. I hate it. I just think it looks silly. It triggers my fight or flight. I hate it. I can't explain why. I'm sorry. And of course, anyone who wasn't a cool kid at school knows that you will do anything to avoid drawing any attention to yourself, especially during PE or gym, as my transatlantic friends would say. Gosh, that was a bit of a mouthful. And sadly, I was not alone in this. Women in Sport published a study in 2022 investigating teen girls' disengagement in sport. They surveyed more than 4,000 teens and found that girls lost interest in sports due to body image issues, lack of self-belief, and fear of safety. Teenage girls are significantly less likely to participate in sports. An underlying narrative prevails that girls are not as competitive, that sport is not important for girls, that they will never be as good at it compared to boys, that sport can be at odds with femininity. Add to that the harassment and unwanted attention teenage girls are subject to when exercising and quite simply, taking part becomes a burden. Instead of bringing freedom and joy, and this is tragic. Sports and athletics are monumental for team building, making friends, building self-confidence, and looking after both your physical and mental health. This isn't just about creating future female athletes. Exercise should be enjoyed by anyone. You don't have to be good at something to participate, which is something I'm still learning. And my love of football was reignited when I watched the Women's Euros last summer. I hadn't watched a match in years. <laughs> My very gay theatre kid friends and I rocked up to the pub for the final, which England won. We were so clueless. A friend of mine even asked, is there an interval? Which is called half time. But we were all engrossed, mesmerised, and now we're all keeping track of the games and we love it. So women's football is booming. Let's celebrate. Do the crab dance we all did when Rush Limbaugh died. <laughs> Things are looking up, right? Uh, well. Well, no. They're still bad. Like, really bad. Not to be a party pooper. But yeah, let's talk about what's going on in the world of women's football. Because it's a mess. So, apologies in advance. I say a lot of the Spanish names very Britishly. I went by the BBC pronunciation, but obviously the people on the BBC are British too. I'm so sorry to any Spanish watchers. Everyone and their mum has been talking about this, but in case you aren't familiar with the situation, the head of the Spanish Football Association grabbed forward player Jenny Hermoso and kissed her on the lip. Hermoso said on a live stream afterwards that she didn't like it. She made a statement about this. The situation left me in shock because of the context of the celebration, and with the time passed and those initial feelings being able to sink, I feel the need to denounce this as I feel that no one, in no workspace, sporting or social, should be victim to this type of unconsensual behaviour. I felt vulnerable and a victim of aggression, an impulsive act, sexist, out of of place and without any type of consent from my part. In short, I wasn't respected. Despite my decision, I have to state that I have been under constant pressure to come out with some sort of statement that would justify the acts of Mr. Louis Reboules. Not only that, but also via different ways and different people. The RFEF has pressured my close circle, 
family, friends, teammates, etc. So I would give a statement that had little or nothing to do with how I felt. So the Spanish Football Federation has threatened to sue her for defamation. Even though there's video, we can see it. There it is. <laughs> they have also threatened to sue the 79 women's football players who signed a letter in which they refused to play for their country as long as Luis Rebules remained in his post. Oh yeah, and he refuses to resign. No voy a dimitir. 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 He claims that a social assassination is taking place. His mum's on hunger strike. It's all very embarrassing. And I know that some people are going to point to the video of Hermoso on the coach after the match where she's apparently laughing at memes from the video clip of the incident, but I don't think this is the gotcha that her critics think it is. When he, when he let go, she should have slapped him around the face, oh, that would have been, if she was so she unhappy about it. On. Sometimes it takes a while for things to sink in, as she said in her statement, and there's no correct or incorrect reaction to your own traumatic experience. And let's just say for the sake of argument that she verbally consented, which she didn't, but let's just say she did, it's still super inappropriate with the power dynamic. He just shouldn't have done it. Never should have done it. Can we all just agree on that? And the thing that's so strange about this is that even though Spanish politicians have condemned him, you know, FIFA have issued him a 90-day ban from all football activity, the Federation is backing him. But interestingly, they did fire the head coach who's been accused of inappropriate behaviour. He was one of the people that applauded during Raboule's I will not resign speech. And in that speech, Raboule's offered him a new contract, so they are close allies. So it kind of backfired for the coach standing by Raboule's. Bet you feel really stupid now, huh? So this situation is still ongoing. So the plot thickens. The news has just come out that he has resigned. He has finally resigned. Yeah, I'm going to... Yes, because I cannot continue my work. However, in his statement, he does not mention Hermoso. That being said, the situation is still ongoing. He could face legal consequences as Hermoso recently filed a criminal complaint against him for sexual assault. I am pleasantly surprised to see both the national and international support of Hermoso. It's just so sad that the organization that is the epicenter of her line of work, her career, is treating her so horribly. Spain has done a lot for women's football, with them being the holders of the under-17, under-20 and senior women's World Cup. Barcelona women's team have reached four Champion League finals in the past five years. But this success has allegedly been met with an abusive work environment. People have been describing this situation as Spanish football's Me Too movement. And there's ideas about how to tackle this institutional problem. Funnily enough, Rabule's uncle publicly condemned him. Dignity is to defend Jenny, to understand understand her and to reproach the shameful behaviour of this president. I think he needs a social re-education program and a re-education in his relationship with women. Now, personally, I think he's going to keep burying his head in the sand, but there is something to be said about restorative projects to deprogram bias and sexist attitudes. And of course, another suggestion is to have more female coaches and to have more women in leadership positions in football federations. And this is not to say that female players shouldn't have male coaches. I think they deserve the best coaches, regardless of their gender. But, you know, gender balance in the workplace is healthy. As someone who went to a school with more boys than girls, uh, this was after the girls' school I went to, that school had an intense rugby culture and it was ripe soil for misogyny. And I want to be clear that this is not a Spain-specific issue. Sport, and especially football, is a money-making industry. Being the world's most popular sport, FIFA generated 7.6 billion in revenue between 2019 and 2022. Money comes first and nothing nothing highlights this as well as the Man United 
slash Mason Greenwood situation. Buckle in. Whew. So let me provide a cliff note summary of the situation. Greenwood was charged with attempted rape, coercive control, and assault. Charges have been dropped but he has not been cleared despite him saying that. And it's important to point out that there is an audio recording of the alleged incident. You can find this very easily on Google. Just search Mason Greenwood recording. Trigger warning though, it's not a pleasant listen, but I just want to make you aware of it so you know I'm not making this up. This is not a simple case of someone being accused, their employer investigating, and finding them not guilty. No, no, it's been a mess. I'm gonna be referring to an episode from the News Agents podcast published on the 22nd of August, 2023. There's an interview with journalist Adam Crafton from The Athletic. These news stories started to appear around, for example, Manchester United wanting to speak to their women's team before communicating a decision to the public. So the logical deduction that people were making out of that was, well, you probably don't need to speak to them if you're not bringing them back. What then happened, I think it was probably the day after I'd been in here, we were then we then received concrete information to say uh, that Richard Arnold, the Manchester United chief executive, had held a meeting with his executive leadership team at Manchester United's training ground on August the 1st, and he'd communicated a plan to bring Mason Greenwood back to the club, back into the first team. He'd even scheduled an announcement that was meant to be August the 4th. That was then pushed back because some of these female players were still out at the World Cup. And we got hold of details from what had been a hugely extensive plan. Well, I mean, this plan included details such as, for example, Manchester United had laid out in a document what kind of photographs they should take of Mason Greenwood during training sessions in order to then filter to the public and choreograph the PR around his return and how he would be received. The manager, Eric Ten Hag, would receive very, very clear PR guidance in terms of how to handle questions, not only in the short term, but also medium term and the long term. And then I suppose the most devastating detail was that United had even prepared kind of a list of external stakeholders, whether they were football pundits or politicians or journalists, but also crucially domestic abuse charities. And they'd categorised these different stakeholders into whether they would be supportive, open-minded or hostile. And then when we reported on Friday that domestic abuse charities were assumed to be hostile, it felt at that point as though Manchester United were in a real public relations nightmare. So this was a PR campaign led not by what's the most moral thing to do, but a cynical mission to keep their star player with as little optical damage as possible. They, of course, have a vested interest in keeping a multi-million pound player in the club. They didn't get an external party to do the investigation, and they didn't consult with domestic violence charities. Also, the icing on top of the cake is that they waited until the end of the Women's World Cup, you know, for better optics, and briefed the women's team before announcing Greenwood's return. I think it's been really interesting the way that so much conversation is centred on what will the women's team think? And very little onus has been put on mm. what about the men? Mm. What about the men? as These fellow players. These fellow yeah. players as allies, the head coach of the men's team who we know was supportive and encouraging of Greenwood coming back. Why is it up to, the, why is it up to women to kick up a fuss? Incredible. Except they've done a U-turn now, which I'll get to in a sec. Now, you might ask, what does this have to do with women's football? Well, firstly, they made it about women's football. They expected their female players to participate in damage control in a way that they did not expect from the men's team, the team that Greenwood was playing for. Secondly, what does this whole incident say about the club's attitudes towards women? It's players it's staff, it's female fans. You can do whatever you want, as long as if we can spin it in a way that still makes us money. At this point in time, the situation has changed. They initially decided to bring him back, hence briefing the staff and the women's team. However, due to a whistleblower revealing this to the press and the resulting public pressure, they have decided not to bring him back. 
Again, I'll link the full statement, but here's a snippet. Based on the evidence available to us, we have concluded that the material posted online did not provide a full picture and that Mason did not commit the offences in respect of which he was originally charged. That said, as Mason publicly acknowledges today, he has made mistakes which he is taking responsibility for. So he is on loan to the Spanish team Getafe, Getafe. boss Jose Bordales said, it is too delicate a situation to trivialize this issue. Everybody knows what happened and appropriate measures were taken. Obviously, we can only talk about football. About other issues, I think that the people and the relevant systems did what they had to do, and everybody knows how it ended, without a condemnatory sentence. He's a footballer of the highest level who comes to Getafe with enormous hope. We are going to help him to recover his best level. Cool. Good for you, babes. Good for you. Cool, cool, cool. I don't want to end on a grim note, so I guess I'll try to find some light in this. They eventually did the right thing after pressure from media outlets, fans, domestic abuse, charities, and government officials, but yay. I suppose that we can be hopeful that when this happens again, because let's be honest, it will, footballers get accused of this stuff quite regularly, that clubs won't be able to get away with this kind of behaviour anymore. As long as if the British media holds them to account and the public. And the main thing is you've got a load of 10 year olds, 12 year olds going, oh the girl's back with him now, oh really? Oh okay, so there's never been a case in the history of domestic abuse when exactly. the partner has got back with the person that abused them, yeah? Oh, oh, oh well she's having a kid with him now. So fucking what? Mm. What's that matter? Do you know how much that annoys me? I'm a father, I've got a daughter, exactly. I've got three sisters. More often than not, Victims of domestic abuse do end up having babies with their partners. They do end up getting back with that person. That's part of domestic abuse. You know what I mean? If any and anyone goes, oh, with a few people, one bloke has got in my comments and gone, it's amazing what AI can do these days. And it's just like, fuck off. On an actual bright note, Alessio Russo has been signed by Arsenal, who is a forward for the Lionesses. Also, Arsenal is bidding for Mary Earps. And <laughs> so What a save, what a moment. Mary, Queen of Stops, strikes again. <laughs> if they sign her, the sleigh would be too much. Apocalyptic sleigh, the world would implode. So, thanks for watching. Sorry a lot of it was so bleak, but you know, the title did give it away, so. If you're a Mason Greenwood fan and you want to send shit through my doorstep, my address is if you genuinely liked the video, make sure to give it a like because one like equals one goal scored through my heart. Aww. Anyway, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.